I'm so very delighted to be with you here tonight at the Korean Book Club. I'm coming to you from Gadigal land of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to elders past and present. My name is Suzanne Leal, and I'll be your host tonight. I'm the author of novels The Deceptions and The Teacher's Secret. I'm also the online host of Thursday Book Club and co-host of the Bad All About Crime podcast. And today it's my great pleasure to be speaking with author Eugenia Kim, courtesy of the Korean Cultural Centre. Ever since it opened in 2011, the Korean Cultural Centre has been a powerhouse of Korean culture, connecting our two countries by deepening our cultural bonds. The Korean Cultural Centre, or KCC, offers something for everyone, from Korean cooking classes, K-pop classes, language classes, art exhibitions, film screenings, and performances. The Korean Book Club has been running since March 2020, showcasing Korean writers and literature. This year is the 60th anniversary of diplomatic relations between Australia and the Republic of Korea. The Korean Cultural Centre planned many events this year, but due to the current lockdown, a lot have had to be postponed. But here tonight at the Korean Book Club, Book Club we've got an extraordinary treat in store for you. This month's book, as you will know, is The Calligrapher's Daughter. Here it is by Eugenia Kim. The Calligrapher's Daughter was shortlisted for the Dayton Literary Peace Prize and was a Washington Post best historical novel and critics pick as well. Eugenia Kim's second novel, The Kinship of Secrets, was a library reads pick and an Amazon best book of the month. When she isn't writing, Eugenia Kim teaches fiction and non-fiction at Fairfield University's MFA Creative Writing Program. So tonight, not only do we have this captivating book to discuss, but we also have the author herself who's joining us from America. Eugenia will be answering questions at the end of the webinar. So please click on the Q&A button to type your question or comment. But now, that's more than enough from me. Welcome to you, Eugenia. It's so, so terrific to have you here. And there you Hello, are. Hello. Now, you've woken up very early to be here with us today. What time is it and where are you coming to us from, Eugenia? Oh, it's 4.30 a.m. in Washington, D.C. You wouldn't know it. Oh, and the backdrop is perfect. The makeup <laughs> is perfect. The attire is perfect. It's, um, it's a delight to have you here. Thank you. Eugenia, The Calligrapher's Daughter is a story of a young girl growing up in Korea last century. When we meet her, she's five years old and it's 1915. When we leave her, it's 1945 and she's 35 years old. So much happens in those 30 tumultuous years in between. Her name's Najin, which is a name and not a name. And her birth in 1910 coincides with the collapse of the Joseon dynasty. What I want to do, just to give a context for our list, our, our viewers tonight, is to know a bit about the Joseon dynasty. What was the Joseon dynasty and why did it collapse? So it was a almost 500 year um, dynasty of uh, one, one family uh, who maintained uh, that, that monarchy for, for all those centuries. And, um, but it, it was a monarchy that, that uh, ruled over a small uh, but fierce agrarian nation. And by the time the turn of the century came, um, so they were very close there. They had relations only mainly with China. Uh, Japan was always an enemy. They had invaded Chosan a couple of times. Um, and so by the time, the 1890s, 1880s came around and trade was increasing throughout the globe. People tried to land on the shores of Korea and um, Korea had wanted to have not, none of it. They wanted to have uh, no, inv no uh, in, uh, visiting people from around the world. They were curious, but they were also very hermetic. So they just wanted to maintain their own um, nation state and and not really be influenced by outside influences. But Japan was right next door. So they couldn't help but not be influenced by them. And so first there were Dutch traders who came and who were imprisoned. And then the Japanese came and they came um, uh, 
not in force, but they came in great numbers. And, and pretty soon, because of international politics, uh, the Japanese became ensconced in the Korean court. And, um, and even though the Korean uh, royalty sent emissaries to US and to Britain to help to remove the Japanese from their nation, nobody listened because Japan had these treaties, we're beginning to have these treaties with the US and with, with Great Britain in order to uh, have more influence in East Asia. And so nobody listened to poor little Korea. And so over time, the, the dynasty uh, fell. K Japan basically just annexed the country after they had been there for about 15 years under with great influence. They started to incringe more and more on the court uh, because they had military might. They had adopted um, modern technology and, and so they had weapons, they had guns and the Koreans had swords. There was just no contest. And within that context, we meet Najin and her family, the Han family. Her father is called the Scholar Han. Can you tell me a bit about him? So the father um, is such an interesting character. At first, I didn't like him because he's the antagonist in my book. <laughs> but then I realized I had to get to know him better. So, uh, so I started to write from his perspective in order to understand who he was. And I understood that he was a man of long tradition, and he was really the symbol of the dying Korea. Uh, so his whole thing was to maintain tradition in order to maintain Korea as a nation. And so, um, so, so his, his uh, antagonism toward his daughter was because she was, she, she was so not traditional. She was modern and she wanted education. She wanted independence. Um, and her, her mother encouraged her in that way. And so the father um, just had a lot of trouble uh, getting beyond his own staunch traditionalism in order to see who she was and in, or, in order to appreciate her. And he was so very conservative in so many ways, and particularly in his career, he was a calligrapher. And that was a very important position. Can you tell me what it meant to be a calligrapher during that time? So calligraphy and scholarship were intertwined. If you were a calligrapher, you were a scholar and vice versa, uh, because writing was a way to express your intellect and your knowledge of the classical, uh, mostly classical Chinese works. So if you were a scholar, you were trained in uh, Confucian mores and also, especially in Korea, more so than in China, Confucianism was um, very strong and so strong it was called Neo-Confucianism. And so, um, so to be a scholar meant you had uh, all this training in order to re receive recognition from the court. And, and he was um, in, he was uh, before the court was dissolved, he was a Viscount. He was, his level was like a Viscount. So, um, so he had some royal approbation. He, he was known, you know, known to the court. He knew the king, he had been there. And so for him to see all that fall apart um, with the influence of the Japanese was, was really devastating. I mean, it was his old whole world crumbling really, isn't it, in that time? Yes almost um, something that he would have grown up thinking could never happen. He would have thought that his position was a rarefied or revered position. And it's very clever how you just watch this crumble as his only daughter rises in a different world. Now, I'd like to focus on Najin. Now, when we meet Najin, she's the only child in the Han family. And as a child, she's teased about her name, why is her name the cause of such such mirth? One of the things that happened in writing this book was I didn't know how to name my character. <laughs> so I tried many, many different names. And, um, and then I realized that um, it, I ha was having such trouble naming her because she had never been given a name. Um, so that was the fiction that I created in order to give her a name that had no meaning. So Korean naming is uh, very, 
it's it's very dependent on what the meanings of the of the uh, the syllables are. So, for instance, my Korean name is Sun Hee, and it means happy flower. Um, and so her name is two syllables, but it has no meaning. It, it actually means nothing. It, it just came from nowhere. It was as if she were named, you know, Mir not even Miriam, which has meaning, but um, uh, just some name like Eugenia, you know, which also has meaning. But um, so, so in order to give her a name, um, I, I just, I made up the fact that uh, she was, her mother was from a place called Najin on the northern coast of Korea. And her mother was also an aristocrat from an aristocratic family. And the mother, because Korean names are not used typically, especially back then, it was really rude to call somebody by their name. So, and especially women, or older people, women and men. So they were all, often referred to by family relational position, like, the mother of Najin, Ma Najin's mother, she would be called, grandmother would be called rather than um, her name, and which was, which was Hae Young. And uh, the father would never be called the father, he would be called the scholar, scholar Han, he would never be called by name, by his first name. And so knowing that, and knowing, knowing that, that that was a Korean tradition, it made me think that, oh, so, um, especially for women, they were only referred to in relationship to how their, what their position in the family was. She was the wife of the scholar Han. Uh, children, it doesn't matter, you would have a name or you'd be called um, baby or child or daughter, but you wouldn't necessarily be called by your name. And so I was thinking when I started doing research for this book, I began to realize more and more how women had no, um, they had no voice in this culture. And so uh, uh, I wanted to um, reinforce that idea that women were silenced. Um, and so one way to do that was to not give her a name and then also to name her after her mother's city. She was called uh, the daughter of the woman from Najin because, or, or the daughter of the scholar Han. Um, and so finally, she once once she was referred to the daughter of the woman from Najin once, an American missionary who spoke a little Korean but wasn't really very fluent heard that and heard that as being Najin was her name, and so that's how she became known was as Najin alone, and so that became her name. So we have this young nameless girl growing up in a vastly different country to what her father knew and her. Her, her ancestors knew. What I found particularly interesting about the book too was the um, coalescing between Confucianism and Christianity. Now, I've always known for me Korea to be a strongly religious Christian country, uh, but I didn't really know the history as to how Christianity came to Korea and how radical a movement it was. So what I'd like to ask you is, first of all, how did how did Christianity meet Confucianism in Korea? And then we'll move on to the radical elements. So, um, so Confucianism came from China. China was like the big brother to Korea. And so there were uh, uh, annual or biannual trips that the Korean court made and the scholars made to China every year they went to Beijing. To, for trade, for to study idea, new ideas, um, to you know, re, to reinforce the bond between the two nations, and so this had been going on for centuries, and so in about 1864, um, uh, earlier than that, Amer no, British French missionaries had uh approached china and pretty soon there were other missionaries as well and they brought the bible and they translated into chinese and so on one of these trade visits around 1860s the koreans came and they discovered this writing that was so unusual and um all these new ideas and and this and um and so at night, new new ideas, but also ideas that were in line with the Confucian thought. You know, honor thy parents. You know, the Ten Commandments were right up there. Um, everything uh, 
So especially uh, the Old Testament really resonated with the Koreans and then as, as an idea. And then this idea of a savior, uh, which was new, was very appealing to them because they were such a difficult oppressed nation. So they needed to have something to lift them up. And so the idea of, of a Christ and salvation in heaven was very appealing. There, were, there is a heaven in, in Confucianism, but it is um, all about revering your elders and being maintained by that, rever that, rev that rever reveration. Um, I think you know what I mean. And so, so the Koreans, uh, because they could all read classical Chinese, uh, took this book back to the king and the king and the queen wanted nothing to do with it, but pretty soon uh, the ideas began to spread throughout the nation. So from the Bible alone, Christianity was introduced into Korea as um, an interesting idea, as a new religion. And because especially in the lower classes, middle and lower classes, there were really no middle, middle class. Um, the idea of salvation in heaven was very appealing. And so it began to uh, really take hold. So Korean culture now, the Christianity now is, um, I think it's a, more than 50% and, the, and mostly the rest is Buddhism and some is Taoism. Um, but, um, uh, but it is, it really made, uh, you know, a foothold in that nation because of the need of the people. So. We come into the book during an independence movement and we see that the Methodist church is a fundamentally revolutionary body. Um, that came as a surprise to me, um, but I imagine it wouldn't come as a surprise to Korean people. Does Methodism have a, that absolutely revolutionary history and uh, life for, in Korea? Well, what happened was the Western ideas that came with Christianity were ensconced in the Methodist in, in the southern part of the nation and Presbyterianism in the northern part of the nation. So um, even Pyongyang at the time was became, became to be known as the uh, Jerusalem of the East because it was so heavily, um, I mean, there were schools, there was a, there was a seminaries, uh, so, so the Christians, were both the Methodists and the Protestants, and the Catholics as well, were there. They brought education to the masses. They brought uh, schools. They brought medicine. They brought hospitals. And so, um, so that was the thing that really affected the elevation of the populace. Education, schools, schools and, and hospitals and clinics. Um, and the way that it happened was, at one point, the, the queen's nephew had been stabbed multiple times, nine times, by an, through an assassination attempt. And this is around 1890s, late 1890s. And the, uh, the imperial doctors could do very little for him because they had no, no advanced knowledge of infection. And so they, as a last resort, they asked the American doctors who was there to come and look at this child and see what they could do. And so over a period of six months, that doctor treated this child and he survived. And because of that, the queen and the king were so grateful that they began to embrace, you know, a, a hospital was allowed to be built, schools were allowed to be built. So um, just because, so that was a key moment that opened the doors to Christianity in, in, in ancient Korea. Well, thank you for such an excellent background. Um, for our viewers out there, this is a book which is the story of one family, but within that family, there is the story of Korea during, during this really tumultuous time. And there are particular examples that, um, that Eugenia uses to show just how difficult things were as this society is moving from uh, a dynasty into the occupation by the Japanese. One particular example I found, I found quite startling was something that happens when Najin is 14 and her father wants her to be betrothed. Over to you, Eugenia, what, what's happening here? What happened to her? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, <laughs> well, this is actually um, a story that that is taken from life. So my mother was um, uh, slated to be married at fourteen, and at fourteen, it was about about time. It was actually a little bit late. She was betrothed to a nine year old boy who was of this of a similar class, and for the father, it was a way to get her out of his hair and to increase his uh, status by marrying into this other family as well. So, so he was hell-bent on having her married. And, um, and, but the mother, but Najin was already in school by that time and uh, was, in, was really loving education and was becoming more independent. And the mother recognized this too. And her, all her mother's own dream, who the mother had been self-taught how to read and write. Her, her brothers had taught her, helped to teach her. So she understood the value of education. And she understood that if this child was to be married, then that would be the end of it. So she conspired to um, send Najin to Seoul at the time they lived in a smaller town outside of Seoul. And she conspired to send um, Najin to Seoul to live with an aunt who was connected to the royal court. And that way, Najin would be, the father would have nothing to say because if the court had requested Najin's presence, then he would have, he would be powerless. And so that's, that's what happened. And that actually happened, except for um, the only thing that is fictional in the book uh, she actually serves in the court with the princess, the last princess of Korea. And, uh, and in real life, my mother just learned about um, the court and the manners of court. Uh, because if she had actually been in court, she would never have been allowed to leave. So that was part of, if you enter into the king, into the uh, service, into the royal um, family, then you, that's it. That's what your destiny is. So earlier on, you spoke about women being silenced. And what I think you do particularly beautifully in this book is that you say, yes, women were silenced. The, cons the society was conservative, but within silence, much power can be had. So behind the scenes, the women are working, uh, are, are trying to save each other, are trying to get ahead. Was that something that was important for you to express when you were writing the book? Yes, most definitely. Um, my mother was a really powerful woman. And so I wanted to express that even though um, women of that era uh, were really squashed by the culture, um, they managed to, you know, have amazing lives and do amazing things. And especially as Christianity became more ensconced and education became more widespread, especially for girls. Um, it's, it's true that women took positions of power. There was one woman in particular in Korean history who is known for her resistance against the Japanese and she was imprisoned and killed. And so she's become a martyr for the movement. So, um, so, uh, so yeah. And then even the, uh, the Christians were able to open a uh, university for women, which is still in existence today. So, you said before, just as we were speaking, that this book is based on your parents' story. And um, some of my work is based on the stories of other people, but never on my family. And in a way, having one step removed, so having the st having written the story of a close friend in, in The Deceptions rather than someone who was my grandmother or my mother or my grandfather was in a way easier. And I'm wondering whether you were reticent to write a family history like this. I don't know if it was reticent so much as um, I was called to do this. Uh, so... My mother and I, she, my mother spoke mostly Korean and I speak only English. I speak a little house Korean, like, you know, saute the garlic. I can, I can say things like that. But, um, and so, so we had a distant relationship. And so, so for me, but the thing that uh, connected me to my mother was she was a great storyteller. And even though I couldn't understand her stories in Korean, my sisters could, and they would tell me what those stories meant. And so I felt um, very connected to her through her stories and through her history more than through our daily life. Um, 
uh, in terms of getting to know her as a woman, getting to know her as a person. Uh, so, because we never really had deep conversations because we couldn't because of our language barrier. So she didn't, she, you know, we knew each other as family, but I didn't understand who she was as a woman and as a person until I, until I started doing this research and, and until I started hearing these stories about her life. And so for me, it was both a way to um, understand more about who she was and, and my father, as well as to um, uh, express uh, my own identity as a Korean American. So, because I really didn't know Korean history until I started re researching this book. And so I didn't understand my own roots, which, um, which was a revelation to see, you know, uh, when you look back into your, into the historical past of your family and you go farther back and farther back, you begin to see how that shaped both your parents and as a result, both who you are as well. So. For me, it was a way to discover um, not who she was and also to honor some of that, to honor the stories that she told me, because there were stories about, you know, kings and kingdoms and imprisonment, and um, uh, they were stories that were just so compelling, but I couldn't identify my mother as a person in them. They were just stories. And so this was a way to be able to integrate those ideas of my mother living this really um, extraordinary life. And, uh, but yeah, it was really hard to separate um, because we didn't get along so well, it was hard to separate the character from my mother. And it took a while to do that, which is why she wasn't named for so long because I didn't want to name her my mother's name, which is difficult anyway. And my mother had two names, it was complicated. And so, um, so in order to separate the character from my mother, um, not naming her was a way to give her a new identity that wasn't necessarily my mother, based on my mom, but not, not my mom. You said you didn't get on with her so well. If you had been brought up speaking Korean rather than English, would that have been different, do you think, looking back? Yeah, most definitely, because my father was fluent in English and he and I were very close. So, um, so I think that it's, it's amazing what a language barrier can, can do or cannot do. Um, and it's, it's a, a great regret of mine that I never took to the lessons my mother tried to give us, you know, because here I was ensconced in American culture and I wanted nothing to do with Korean. You know, I just wanted to be blonde hair, blue eyed and, you know, perfect in, in the American way. And so, so I rejected most things Korean as much as I possibly could, especially as I got into my teen years and was very rebellious. Um, so, so yeah, so the language, the regret that I have over never being able to speak Korean and never being able to really um, have a deep conversation with my mother is, um, is, is one of, you know, the few regrets that I have in, in my life. When you first published The Calligrapher's Daughter, your parents had, were, were both dead. Would you have been able to publish the book while either of your parents were still living? I would have been delighted to be able to do that. Um, I did tell my mother, it took me 15 years to write this book. So she was still alive when I was working on it. So um, I did tell her that I was working on it and I was able to interview her for a few small details. Like if you had um, a leisure time in Seoul, what would you do? And she would. she's the one who told me that um, they would go to gardens, they would go, there was a zoo, they would do that, they would do things like that. Um, like, what would you do on a first date was my whole question. And so she said, oh, there was no such thing as a first date. And so she knew I was writing this, but um, she also, when I told her that I was writing about her life, her, her reaction was, oh, well, it'll come to nothing. Nobody cares about that. So, <laughs> so she was um, a little selfless and unworthy about her own story. Do you think writing this book has recalibrated your relationship with your mother, even though she's no longer alive? Yeah, most definitely. Um, uh, now I have a sense of what she lived through and uh, how, how difficult it was and what a triumph as a result her life is, her life was, um, because, because of 
the tremendous change that she had witnessed in her own life and then coming to America and um, embracing, you know, this new culture um, in a way that was really unprecedented in her family. So she was really a pioneer in so many ways and I admire her for her resilience and her strength and, um, and her ability to raise six children. That was really, you know, incredible. And to sort of have survived um, the Japanese occupation. And so that's actually what started me writing this story was I was uh, curious about, I, I understood that the Japanese annexed Korea in the year that my mother was born. And so she lived 35 years of her life under Japanese rule from birth until age 35. And I, and I just could, and, and yet she was so incredibly nationalistic and Korean. So I wanted to understand how could she do that? How could she remain so Korean under this Japanese rule? And so that's why, that's the other reason why I wrote the book, because I was curious about um, Korean nationalism, why it was so strong. I was talking to Eugenia before we started tonight, and I was just saying that during this lockdown, which has been lengthy for those of you who aren't in um, in Australia, uh, I was listening to The Calligrapher's Daughter, and I was listening to it on audio because I, I run in the mornings to, um, to escape <laughs> a full house more than anything. And I do think that this has gone a long way to keep me sane and to get me, me settled during this very difficult time because it's not only an epic it's a very personal story of a young girl who turns into a woman who, for the time I was listening to the book, I became. I became her and I, I walked as far as I could in her shoes. And, you know, this may sound trite, but I thought, well, if Najin could uh, survive such a time, this is a small thing to do. This is a small thing to ask. So it was exactly the right book at exactly the right time for me. And so, Eugenia, when you said, actually, I've got a slideshow about um, my family, I felt almost emotional because I thought, I know Najin so well, and now I get to see her as well. So I'm hoping, Eugenia, you might like to show us the slideshow of the people that inspired this book. Oh, I'd love to do that. I'd love to do that. Let me do the logistics of that. And, and I'll talk a little bit. Okay, so, so my mother, whose name is Alice Han Kim, she was born September 17th, 1910, a month after Japanese Treaty of Annexation, like I said, and my father, Jacob Kim, was also born on September 17th, but the year before in 1909. So after they learned that each other had the same birthday, they knew they were destined for marriage. My father's paternal grandfather was the leader of a small fi fishing village. And because of his involvement in the independence movement against the Japanese, he was arrested and tortured, and he eventually died from those injuries. Uh, his son, my grandfather, um, uh, moved to Pyongyang and uh, my father's father, my grandfather, who was pictured in front of the church, he grew to prominence as a minister of the Presbyterian Church in Pyongyang. And my father is in the middle, in the back, on, in the photo on the right. My father went to Sung Seal Academy, run by the Presbyterian missionaries, graduated at age 15, and, and then attended Union Seminary in Pyongyang. He hoped to follow his older brother's uh, footsteps to study theology in America. My mother was born into the Yang Ban Han family in Kapyang, and they later moved to Kesong, which had better schools for my mother and her younger brother. My mother was educated in missionary schools until age 14, when my grandfather attempted to marry her off, as we, as we talked about. But my grandmother was so upset with this idea that she secretly wrote to the relative in Seoul, and uh, my mother was sent to live with this aunt and learn royal manners, which was something she was proud of her entire life. She attended Ihua University. She's on the right in the, both photos. Uh, 
She studied early childhood education, then taught kindergarten in missionary schools. By then, the family was too poor to pay for my mother to live in the dormitories at Ihua. So she took the train four hours from Kesong to Seoul to be at school at 9 a.m. On the train, she met a Reverend Kim, my father's father. He was so struck by this young woman who would ride the train eight hours to attend college that he thought her a likely match for his second son. And she herself was intrigued by a family of ministers. Now in her 20s, my mother, who was working at the missionary's Hostin school, could no longer avoid marriage. The match was made, and my parents were married in Manchuria on August 31st, 1937. My father's plan to study in America had already been made, and he left for the U.S. 20 days after their wedding. The plan was that my mother would follow in a month's time, so both newlyweds planned to study in America. But on September 9th, Japan invaded North China, and all of Korea was mobilized for the war. My mother's traveling documents were denied and she was told if she wanted to study at a foreign college to attend Tokyo University, which she chose not to do. And so my newlywed parents were separated for eight years until the end of the Pacific War. In America, my father worked as a houseboy and learned how to cook and do housework. He ended up at Princeton Theological Seminary from which he graduated. Throughout those years of studying, his father warned him not to return to Korea because Jap Japan had grown increasingly suspicious of Korean nationals who were living abroad, and my father would surely face prison if he were to return. But then Japan attacked Pearl Harbor, and my father keenly felt the need to contribute to the war effort, so he found a job translating Chinese and Japanese classified documents into English for the Office of Special Services, the World War II agency that later became the CIA. My mother, after she was de denied her dream to study in America, dutifully went to live with her in-laws in Pyongyang, which is, what, which is what married women do, they live with their in-laws. It turned out to be a disastrous experience. Complications and misunderstandings grew between my mother and her in-laws, especially her, her father-in-law. And after two years, she begged her mother to write to Reverend Kim. My mother's mother lied, saying she was ill and needed her daughter at home. So once again, my grandmother, who is on the left standing up, uh, helped my mother, who is, who is crouched, escape an untenable situation. My mother never told my father how miserable she was during those two years with his family, but she told us. She returned to teach at the missionary school, but, Ch but Japan's war with China escalated and soon the American mission schools were closed. She found a job at an orphanage in Suwon and lived and worked there for some time. She's pictured on the very top left at the organ or the spinet piano, I'm not sure what it is. And this is a photo from when the Japanese came to visit. So the children were dressed well and had all had recent haircuts. The, and in this picture, you can see the Japanese inspector with his uh, arms on his hands. So she had to quit jo jo that job suddenly because the orphanage director told her that he was in love with her. And as a married woman whose husband wasn't around, she felt she had to quit, though she hated to leave the children. Then, the day after Pearl Harbor, my mother was arrested by the Japanese, considered a spy because her husband was in America. She was physically unharmed, though she suffered cold and deprivation and humiliation in her prison cell. She said at night she heard people being tortured. She was in prison for 100 days. My grandmother walked to the prison every day, two hours in snow and ice, to deliver food to my mother and clothing. But she was never allowed to see her, nor was the food or clothing delivered until the very last day before my mother was released. And then the Pacific War was over and the Americans occupied South Korea. My parents had lost contact after Pearl Harbor and for years neither knew if the other was dead or alive. By this time, my mother's family had moved to Seoul. 
My father heard that the U.S. Army was looking for Korean English translators, and when the Army learned he could translate Japanese and could read Chinese, he was signed on immediately and became a civilian field officer. He flew on U.S. Army transport to South Korea in October 1945. He had a Seoul address for his Han family, but never having lived in Seoul, he had no idea where to find his wife. The first thing he did after checking into U.S. military government headquarters at the Bando Hotel was to request, requisition a jeep in order to find his wife. By sheer chance, his older brother, who lived in Los Angeles, had also returned to Korea for missionary work and was in the lobby of that hotel. He was able to direct my father to the house. My father was an intellectual a minister who doled out wisdom and guided others in times of trouble and heightened emotion. He himself was not prone to expressiveness. The one time he told me about this reunion, he was so overcome he could barely speak of it. My father worked with the U.S. military government in Korea for three years, beginning as a translator and eventually heading up reform of the education suits, uh, system, merging colleges and um, hiring school leadership. Though he had no experience in education, he spoke English and so the military government uh, trusted him. My mother adopted a daughter during the war and bore another daughter and son. In this picture on the left, you can see, if you look carefully, you can see that she's quite pregnant. So she, they had three children, and then um, uh, my and then uh, my father wanted to bring my mother to America to show her what the some some of the dream that you know she never had the opportunity to experience. And so they came to America in 1948 just for a year or so, so that my mother could experience uh, this country. And they left one daughter behind with grandmother as a guarantee of sorts that they would return. So the story of my sister's separation as a result of the Korean War is fictionalized in my second novel, The Kinship of Secrets. Because my family's stories were the bridge between my Korean and American selves, to have written these books, to have researched and learned about Korea in order to write The Calligrapher's Daughter has been an exceptional privilege. And it's a privilege to be here talking about it with you today. Thank you. Oh, that was marvellous, Eugenia. That was absolutely marvellous. Can I say, just as I saw that last screen, the cover for The Kinship of Secrets is just beautiful. Yeah, that was, um, so that was a merging of the original uh, cover of the, kin of, the, of the Kinship of Secrets. Yeah, that was uh, actually the UK version that the Americans then adopted because it was such a successful cover. Yeah, thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Look, thank you very much for, for that. I think I've monopolized you enough, um, Eugenia. We've got lots of questions that have come in the Q&A function. So this is the time now, if you've had a question on your on the top of your tongue and um, you'd like to ask Eugenia, uh, we've, got, we've got 15 minutes left for questions. And uh, so please keep them coming. Eugenia, I'm going to start with a question from Helene Dowdle. And her question is this, didn't Buddhism play a large part in society during that time? And when she says that time, we're talking about the Jozan dynasty. Yeah, Buddhism was huge. So it was um, Buddhism and Confucianism both that were uh, highly influential in Korean culture in the Joseon dynasty. And according to what King was in power um, Buddhism would have more prominence or Confucianism would have more prominence. So it was a mixture of both uh, religions, but they were close enough, they were close enough in, um, in, in cultural mores that it wasn't a problem for them to coexist. We have a question from Michelle Chung and her question is this. Um, were local people literate during this time? Could people who are not scholars study Confucianism and practice calligraphy? No, um, no. Scholarship was really uh, uh, restricted to people who had family name, um, who, who had previously been scholars. So even if there was no money in the household, if your father had been uh, or your grandfather had been a member of the royal court at some point, uh, 
then it would that would trickle down that name would trickle down and so pretty soon there were all these scholars vying to be um, appointed to court positions and so there was an annual examination that you had to take and so it was all about classical education classical chinese education learning poetry um, learning the texts uh, and so um, i lost my track here what was i what was the question so the question was um were local people are uh, people literate and could people who were not educated study Confucianism and practice calligraphy? No. So what happened was it, it, there was this great divide in the nation between those who were educated and the, the, you know, the upper classes, even if the upper classes were poor and the, and the masses who were mostly the farmers, the peasants. So since it was an agrarian nation, it was very much, um, you know, and the education was really rare for the peasant class. Uh, and it was really also incredibly rare for a peasant to rise above his position to go into, in, in, to go into have the ability to be educated. So, but that began to, that, so that changed when the missionaries came and, and started opening schools. Thank you. We have a question from Diane Sylvester. This is um, a comment and a question. Diane says, thank you for your time, Eugenia. You seem to have captured many of the traditional Korean traits and culture in their characteristics and their situation. Did you use the creative space in your novel to deviate from these more realistic traits or culture and push the boundaries? Actually, um I knew so little, I knew Korean culture by having absorbed it in my family, but I knew so little about its origins. Like for instance, how the, what the, what the principles were behind um, the way that we, that the way that Koreans eat. And there were principles of uh, both, not necessarily Confucian, but the, the idea of herbal medicine um, was always a way in, you know, it was Chinese medicine, and that trickled into Korea as well. So there were five principles of eating. Um, and so to learn about those things really helped to, me to inform more about my own sense of Korean identity. So um, does that answer the question? I think it does. Thank you, because we've got lots of questions. Um, so I'm going to ask you uh, another question, which is from uh, Helena Dowdle. And she, her question is this, do you know anything about why your mother adopted a child? And was that common? I know a lot about that. And that's also the basis for um, the story of the, of the kinship of secrets. Um, and it, it, it was not uncommon. It was common for adoptions to happen. For instance, if a woman had no sons, then she would adopt a nephew uh, in order to, especially if she were an upper class person, in order to in order to have that line continue, so so adoptions were common in for that reason, but it was more uncommon to adopt a daughter. Um, the reason my mother was a midwife and uh, an obstetrician, and so she delivered lots of babies. And um, in Seoul, uh, during the during the yeah Pacific War during the Pacific War when the Japanese and America were in battle, um, a woman came to the hospital and delivered a baby and then left. She abandoned the child. Mm. And, and this child was so beautiful and so perfect, perfectly formed that my mother came hugely enamored of her. But, um, you know, she was a single woman with, but, and no one else could take the baby because there was very little milk. Uh, there was, there were no resources and no one, and it was a missionary hospital and most of the missionaries had left. So no one had resources to adopt this baby and she couldn't not take the, leave this child to an orphanage. So she just adopted her. Michelle has a second question, and this, this is her question. Do you think that storytelling is part of Korean culture or something that is just in your family? And then she has a comment. It's so fascinating how this all happened despite the language barrier. So yeah. the is about storytelling. Oh, I think storytelling is key in every culture. It's how cultures propagate themselves. Um, 
wow, if we didn't have stories, if I weren't a storyteller, I don't know what I'd be doing. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, uh, so I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't restrict it to Korea alone. I would, I would say that it's, you know, it's the, it's, it's how we, it's how we continue our human history uh, throughout time from the very beginning. Thank you. There's a number of more questions, but just before I ask the next question, I just wanted to share a couple of the chat comments that um, that have been been um, people have been writing. So excited for this! Thank you. I look forward to book club each month. Uh, thank you so much. These photos are amazing. Incredible story. What an honor to see these photos. Uh, and from Melanie, waking, uh, walking two and a half hours every day. What a wonderful mother your grandmother was. It makes me emotional thinking of your mother in prison for so long. Your family story is such an important one to, to tell. And um, there's a lot of agreement with that. An inspiring story, an amazing story. Marvellous. It's an unreal story. Now I'm going to get the audio book. Um, I definitely need to buy both books. I can see The Calligrapher's Daughter as a film script too. And um, then, then what, what I'm going to mention now, having heard all those comments and just seeing how many people have so enjoyed this conversation today, stay put, we're still, we've still got 10 minutes of questions left. But I just wanted to announce um, that the Korean Cultural Centre has a... Um, has, has, has a competition going and that 10 participants who attend tonight uh, will, win 10, will win a copy of uh, The Calligrapher's Daughter which is the book of the month. So um, just for participating, you're in the running for this prize. And if you are indeed the winner, you'll be contacted by the Korean Cultural Centre next Monday. So that's exciting. And um, I can't tell you how highly I recommend this, um, this beautiful story, particularly for our times. Now, we've got about seven minutes to go. So let's, let's get back to the questions. This is your book club. So... Um, let me ask your questions. Uh, it's a question from Marianne, and her question is this. Where did you fit into the children that your parents had? How many parents, children did they have all together, and where were you born? So there was the adopted child, and then uh, two more were born in, in Korea, and then three more were born in the U.S., and I'm the last of six. So, <laughs> so I'm the baby of the family and probably gave my parents the most trouble <laughs> as a result. <laughs> Charmaine's got a comment and also a question. Her comment is this. Thank you for sharing an epic story of how women who are silenced for a long time in a paternal society get to stand uh, where they want to be and should be. What do you think of the Korean society um, which is known to be strongly paternal or strongly patriarchal even up to this time. It is, but look at the women in Korea today. They are, um, you know, they're holding positions in in the political um, in the political scene and uh, culturally, they are so prominent. Uh, they they hold church positions. So leadership is um, is no longer the realm of men alone. Uh, there was a woman president. So, um, so you know, they've really come to, to, to bear in, in Korean culture, uh, even though it is still a patriarchal society, uh, women are afforded all the same rights as men on, on it, but, you know, it was not so long ago, 1960s, that um, the, there was a law on the books that if a wo woman was found to be adulterous, then the husband had the right to murder her. So that law was an ancient law that was finally struck down. Um, but so that's how recent the patriarchal society was still still had its grips on the nation. But the women rose up and have been incredibly um, powerful and verbal, both in in the arts and in the po political realm, and in and but throughout the culture. So, um, and my mother herself, if she had remained in Korea, she became a writer and an artist, uh, and and her writings have been published in Korean. So you know she had a, a, an influence, an influence of her own. 
Thank you. Melanie's got a comment and also a question. Her comment is this one. I wonder if we can read your second book for book club in the future. It sounds like a wonderful story. How emotional and beautiful. So I'll, I'll leave that with the powers that be. Um, quest, the question from Melanie is this one. Can you please share more about how you went about researching your books? It must have been extensive. I love The Calligrapher's Daughter. What a beautiful story. So it's a, it's a question about research. Thank you. So, yeah, research was... Um, when I began research, the thing that I discovered, so I could only research in English. And the only research that I found at the time I was researching, which was in the 90s, about the Japanese occupation period, there would be a whole history book of Korea, but there would be maybe two paragraphs about the Japanese occupation. So I, I had to, and then also they were history books, they were American history books. And so I felt as, as if I needed to read more primary source material. So I began to read um, memoirs of uh, like the, some of the earliest memoirs of Korean Americans who came over um, in, in the early 1900s. They came to Hawaii first and then to the West Coast. And so I began to read some of those memoirs to get a sense of um, you know, what they were leaving and what they found here in order to understand more about who, who these kinds of people were that lived in that era. And then I read, read um, classic uh, Korean uh, novels in, that had been translated into English. So there weren't that many of them, but there were a few that took place during that period. So, um, so that's the kind of research I did. I ended up reading about 500 books um, in order to get a good sense of, and they were both fiction, nonfiction, um, memoirs, some, you know, some really sort of dry technical histories. Um, the History of the Food was one of my most fascinating books that I read, as well as Herbal Medicines, um, because she, since my character was uh, an, um, involved in medicine, she would know about those things as well, so. It's a, it's a mammoth effort in terms of research. Um, there is so much I wanted to ask you, Eugenia, about your, um, your experience as a teacher of writing and your writing process. I think it's a conversation in itself uh, with the amount of experience you have, not only honing your own craft, but helping others to do theirs. But um, perhaps that's for another time because we're coming towards the end of our session now. One question I did want to ask you just before we go, uh, are you writing at the moment? Is there something you can talk about or not talk about? I am working on my third novel and it is about uh, an American missionary who goes to Korea during uh, post-Korean War era. And that's about all I can say about it because there's still a lot I don't know. <laughs> and how do you manage that? Do, do you, are you the sort of writer that writes in a chunk? Do you write for a small amount of time every day? What's, what's your process? I write um, for a small amount of time and then also I write in chunks. So my life is such that I try to devote at least, you know, a couple hours, maybe four hours if possible every day. Um, because it's, it's such hard work to be to create, as, as you know, Suzanne. It's it's just hard to sit at your computer and generate um, a story. So uh, so so it takes me, and I'm a slow writer. It takes me a long time. This book took 15 years. My second book took seven years. So I'm hoping this third book will take you know three and a half years. <laughs> and so far we're at three and a half years. So I don't know. <laughs> In, uh, my, yeah, so. in my experience, a lot of very enthusiastic book club members are also secret or not so secret writers. If you had one tip for our viewers here who may be writing or wanting to start writing, what would it be? Oh, I just don't ever give it up. Just understand that sometimes it's hard work. And those moments when you feel as if you are transported to the story that you're writing are so rare and so valuable uh, in the creative process that uh, don't give it up. Go to workshops if you feel stuck, like you don't know what you're doing. Attend a workshop or, you know, find a mentor or find someone who will read your work and give you feedback so you know what you're doing. Uh, 
or you know go back to university and, and get a degree in, in creative writing. It's I think that um, the creative process is so important to foster in everybody. And so if you can find your way to it through writing or through knitting or through you know cooking, whatever, um, being creative, I think, is just such an integral part of being a whole human being that uh, I totally encourage you know, any, any effort that you're trying to make poetry, nonfiction, writing your own memoir, writing your own family stories is, is a great way to start. I'm going to end before I thank you and um, say good night to our viewers with one comment from Angelina. And she says, your story is one of power of strong women during a tumultuous time. Your writing of your family story is exquisite. The descriptions of the place and time and strengths reflected the emotional story. I loved the book. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank and you I so much. Say, I don't think I can say it any better, Eugenia. So I'm going to say me too. Thank you so much for your time today. It's been a delight. Thank you so much. I really appreciate being here. And, and thank you for all the attendees who came. It's really amazing. Appreciate it. <laughs>